Thank you. 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 Over the next three weeks, we'll be dropping the top three no filter episodes of 2022 into your feed alongside our usual brand new episodes. We are not doing a best of summer. We have got so much goodness to pop into your ears. We loved making all of the episodes that we've made for you in 2022. They've been more than 50 and we hope that you've enjoyed listening to them. The best way to support us if you have enjoyed listening to all of those episodes is to become a Mamma Mia subscriber. If you already are, thank you so much. We will put a link in the show notes and we cannot wait to tell more stories in 2023. For Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter and I'm Mia Friedman. Until she was 40 years old, Every aspect of Julia Hart's life was controlled in the most strict way you could imagine. What she ate, what she thought, who she married, when she had children, what she wore, how she had sex. Pretty much every single thing that she was allowed to do in a day. At 19, Julia was married off to a man she didn't know. And over the next 23 years, she would be pregnant 10 times and have four children with him. It was a totally isolated life, controlled by her husband, who had to follow strict laws about every aspect of their lives as a couple, even sex, as dictated by their religious leaders. What made the marriage so miserable is that we had very clearly delineated and defined roles. He was the master and commander. I was the silent, subservient slave. And that didn't work well for either of us because I'm not silent and I'm not good at being subservient and he's not good at being a master. So it just was a fiasco. For example, nobody other than Julia's husband could see her hair, her actual hair. She had to wear a wig all of the time, sometimes even at home. She wasn't allowed to use birth control because her sole purpose, and this goes for all the women in their community, was to have as many children as possible and take care of the children and the men so that the men could focus on their religious studies. Julia and the other members of her community weren't allowed to watch TV or even have one in the house. She couldn't even read books unless they were religious. And listening to this, you might think it ticks every box for a cult. But technically, it was called, and still is, a religion because Julia was part of an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in New York. And she'd lived in this way, she says it's like living in the 18th century, since she was a girl, because that's when her parents, who had been, until then, a fairly ordinary Jewish couple, started to become extreme in the way that they practised their religion. And so it was like my world shrunk, but not all at once. It doesn't all occur simultaneously. They take away our rights very, very carefully and slowly and then you wake up one morning and you wonder how you got there. If you've watched the documentary series on Netflix called My Unorthodox Life, you'll know that after her fourth child was born, Julia decided to escape from her ultra-Orthodox community and build a whole new life. She's now the CEO of the largest conglomerate of modelling agencies in the world. I'm married to an amazing man. I have four incredible children. It's really hard to imagine that just a few years ago, I was living in an extreme ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, and then I just packed up and left. It's a bloody big swing. A woman who had never been educated, never driven a car, been on the internet, had an orgasm, or even left her house without fully covering all parts of her body and her hair, becomes a New York celebrity and business powerhouse in just a few years. And something that I just wanted to make really clear and emphasise is that Julia's experience is her experience of a very specific, extreme form of Judaism that is not representative of all Jewish people. It is not even representative of all Orthodox Jewish people. Like every religion, there are a myriad of sects and subsections of Jewish practice, even within the Orthodox community. 
So each have very different practices and can and do vary according to custom and geographic location. So with all that said, here's Julia's story. Julia, most Orthodox Jews are born into an Orthodox family, so they know no different. But your parents weren't strict in their Judaism when you were born and they only started becoming much more orthodox and much more well radicalized I guess you could say as you got older as a child what are your memories of the biggest changes that you experienced as your parents got more and more Jewish that's the danger of when people are taking away rights you don't even realize because it's so gradual and so it was like my world shrunk but not all at once, right? At first it was, okay, Julia, we're going to keep kosher. That means you can't eat at your friends' houses anymore. But it's okay. They can come to you. Okay. Then it was, okay, Julia, you can't wear shorts anymore. You can't dance in public anymore. You can't try out for the cheerleading squad. And then it was, cover yourself head to toe. And then before you turn around and know it, your life is this big. You know what's happening in America now with uh, pro-choice and all of that. It's kind of like that. It doesn't all occur simultaneously. They take away our rights very, very carefully and slowly. And then you wake up one morning and you wonder how you got there. And you were also a kid. So it's not like you could argue with your parents, could you? Oh, yeah. Of course not. And honestly, as a kid, I kind of loved it because... You know, children are very black and white. They love rules. So to be told that this is what God wants and this is not what he wants seemed perfectly rational to me. I didn't understand nuance and gray and I understood do or don't. When your parents moved from the town you were living in because there wasn't a big enough Orthodox community and it was hard to find the right kosher yeah. food and restaurants, where did you move to and, and what was it like? We moved to a place called Muncie, New York, which, you know, the easiest way to describe it to you would be to say, go back a couple hundred years and the life women lived in the 1800s is exactly the life I live now. So imagine Bridgerton or The Pursuit of Love or any of these shows, minus the fancy costumes where women are not educated, where they're married off, where they're told they're inferior to men, that was the world I came from. As someone in Australia hearing about New York, you know, sex in the city, New York, Mm -hmm. so much happens in New York. What you describe, how does that exist within a place like New York? Look, think of any kind of fundamentalist or extremist community. The first thing that they need to do is isolate. Extremism only can live and thrive when you're isolated. Because we were taught that anyone outside my community was ready to turn me into my skin into lampshades and burn me in an oven. I was taught that all non-Jews and the friendliest ones are the most dangerous because, you know, they pretend to be your brother, but they're still Asa, right? They're still that guy who, when the shit hits the fan, they're going to come, they're going to come for you. And so there is this division and the laws are there to divide you. For example, if an irreligious Jew or a non-Jew touches a wine bottle, the wine becomes not kosher, even if it's kosher wine. If an irreligious Jew or a non-Jewish person turns on a flame, even if the pot is kosher, the food is kosher, it is rendered immediately non-kosher. And the concept is they're not trustworthy. They're the others. We are the chosen ones. Everybody else is the others. And so it's a very closed and secretive community by definition because they don't interact with the outside world. You have cell phones, but they're called kosher cell phones where they only have dialing access, but no internet, right? You're not allowed to watch television. You don't have TVs in your home. You don't have computers. You don't go to movies. You don't read secular literature. You are completely divorced from the outside world. I lived in the 1800s. That's the easiest way to describe it. Somewhere between the 1800s and The Handmaid's Tale, 
minus killings and, you know, Jews are not violent people just by definition. So, you know, nobody hurt me physically. It's just, you know, mental and emotional anguish, I guess is probably the best word, but it only exists in isolation because when you, when you open the doors to the outside world, you realize we're all the same. My first friends when I came out of my community were Muslims and Hindus because we shared stories. It was the same story. We all had to be covered. We were all married off in, in these, you know, arranged marriages. We were all told that our purpose was to have children and to be, a, you know, subservient to our husbands. It was exactly the same, which is what proves to me that this has nothing to do with Judaism. Mm -hmm. This is extremism, pure and simple. And all those same laws exist in every extremist culture. I don't care what it's called. Julia, it's true that the Jews have been persecuted over hundreds of years. Oh, yes. How much is the Holocaust used as a constant example of what can happen and how people feel about Jews? Well, it's actually even crazier than that because what we were taught in my community is that the Holocaust happened because we didn't separate ourselves. God brought Hitler to separate us. And the biggest proof that they use is that the first Nuremberg laws mirror the laws in the Torah. No intermarriage. Jews, in my world, don't eat with non-Jews. Don't go to school. I mean, it was... Basically, the story I'm told is this is what happens when you don't self-isolate. God brings a Hitler to isolate you. So it wasn't just a cautionary tale about the outside world. It was a cautionary tale to us that if we do not keep ourselves separate, if we do not completely divorce ourselves from the outside world, God will bring another Hitler. And the other thing which shockingly people don't realize is that I was taught that we were the only people upon whom genocide has been perpetrated. And then I left and I found out that is patently untrue. The Tutsi or Watsuzi in in, um, Rwanda. Rwanda. You've got the Turks and the Armenians. I mean, by far, the Jews are not the only people that others have tried to eliminate from the planet. And that was told to us, shockingly enough, as a measure of chosenness. God loves you so much that when you stray, he punishes you in a way that he punishes no one else. So even not only were we taught that Hitler came because it was our sin, we were also taught that the Holocaust is a proof of God's love for us. And of course, a cautionary tale about how terrible non-Jews are. Your mum wanted a lot of children and after she had you, she had trouble falling pregnant. What changed for her and what effect did that have on on your life? Well, my mother was told when she got married that she can't have any children. And she was not able to have children. And then she had me, her, you know, she thought, oh my goodness, my miracle baby. And then she had 10 years of miscarriages. And the year that we became kosher is the year that she first got pregnant with my sister. Can you explain what kosher is to people who don't know? Oh, so kosher is a very intricate set of laws uh, that determine what a Jew can and cannot eat, how they eat it, with what food they eat it, on what plates they eat it, how it's cooked. So for example, first of all, there's certain foods that can never be kosher, crustaceans, pork, right? Jews don't believe in eating anything that's also a predator. So there are no predators that are kosher, right? So there, you can't eat wolf or fox. Anything that hunts other animals is also not kosher. In addition to that, the way they're killed has to be very specific. This is my favorite part, is that if it's not killed humanely and it feels any pain, it's not kosher. That's actually very beautiful. Mm. Um, So to be kosher, they have a very specific way of killing the animal. So it's on the carotid vein. And so instantaneous death, no pain. And if it's not killed that way, it's not a kosher animal. But then, of course, a rabbi has to see it and there can't be blood and it needs to be soaked. And and you can't mix dairy and meat. Uh, You can't have a cheeseburger, for example. There's no 
chicken, melon, like the, it, those things don't exist, right? So no dairy and meat mixed together. Six hours in between eating anything that is meat, chicken, poultry, fowl, anything that's, you know, meaty in taste, you have to wait six hours before you have a piece of cheese or ice cream or anything like that. And then you have all these different sets of dishes because you can't wash meat dishes at the same time you wash milk dishes. So it's very complex. So when your mum became kosher, she was able to fall pregnant and she saw this as a divine sign that she was on the right path. Correct. She saw the fact that the, that right after she became kosher, she all of a sudden became pregnant and then one after the other. There's 10 years in between me and my next sibling and then I go on to have seven siblings. So, you know, she felt like this was God telling her that she had chosen the right way. Because you were the oldest child, you were 10 and your mum had really difficult pregnancies, what responsibilities did you have in the family and, and where was your dad? What did he do? So my father worked, he first worked for IBM and then he started, when Pure Stroika happened, he started a business in Russia. But as you said, my mother had extremely difficult pregnancies and she gave birth one after the other. My my sister who's after me, Chana, is 11 months older than my brother, Yitzchak, and it just boom, 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 boom. So I was left to take care of them. I fed them. I, you know, wiped their little bottoms. I changed their diapers. I put them to sleep. I did their homework to the extent that my youngest brother, who is actually younger than my eldest daughter, I nursed him simultaneously with my daughter because my mother and I gave birth six months apart. Bachava was six months older than Shlomo, my brother, not Shlomo, my son. And my mother was, was unable to nurse. And she said, look, you're already nursing Bachava, Just nurse your brother. And so there I was nursing my brother and my daughter at the same time. And, you know, when I was raising them when I was younger, they called me mom. They actually called me mom. And when I got engaged, right, to the guy I didn't choose, I was 19 years old, they packed their bags. They thought that they were moving with me. It didn't occur to them that they would have to stay with their actual parents because I had raised them. I was literally their mom. And I don't know if I write this in the book or not because I had to cut a lot out, but I think the first two weeks or so, my siblings lived in my apartment with me and my new husband because my parents couldn't handle the crying. Like, okay, Julia, just take them for a few weeks and then we'll figure it out. So that's what ended up happening. Oh my, my first few weeks of marriage, my, all my siblings came <laughs> because they just were so distraught. I mean, I was their mom and I yeah. disappeared. They wanted mommy. When your parents went on a holiday, how old were you and who were you in charge of? How many children and, and around what ages? So I was 16 years old, and at that point, I had Hannah, Yitzchak, Naomi, and Yoni, four babies. And Yoni was, I think, uh, maybe a, a year, and then Chaviva was maybe six months old. So yeah, actually five babies. 16 years old, I've got a newborn, Chaviva, and then three little children, two, three, and four, like just all smushed together. My parents said, we're going on a vacation, bye, have fun. And I was left as a 16-year-old with five children, babies, literally, five and under. My sister under me at 16 was six, which means my brother Yitzchak was five, which means my sister Naomi was three, and my brother Yoni was one, and then Chaviva was a new one. What did you do, Julia? Well, I just wanted to keep them alive. I was so afraid. The first night that my parents left, one of them caught a stomach bug. And so for the first few days, they were just vomiting all over oh everywhere. God. And I was just so overwhelmed because I was by myself. I was 16 years old. Yeah. And I was just afraid that this newborn baby would die. Yeah. You know, and I would kill this child. I was so petrified. And also, you you know, you start worrying like, oh, what if she throws up in her sleep and she can't breathe? And this is massive responsibility. Yeah. And then if that weren't enough... It was one of the hottest summers in Rockland County history, and the air conditioning system broke. And I kept on going downstairs and like hitting the breaker to like restart it, and it kept on, you know, turning off. 
And then finally, I go downstairs like a third time or second time and I hit that breaker and I'm about to hit the breaker and I lean against the wall and it's scalding hot. The wall is scalding hot. So I got a little nervous. I called my next door neighbor Sunday night and I said, I'm so sorry to bother you. I'm alone with all these kids. Something's wrong with my air conditioning. Can you come over? He comes over. He calls his friend who is an electrician. Luckily, he came over. And he told me that had I hit that breaker one more time, the house would have exploded because the circuits in the walls had overheated. And had I hit it one more time, they would have literally exploded. So I remember that feeling of thinking, I have all these little lives Mm -hmm. in my hands and we could have all died. So yeah, it was not one of my most favorite experiences. And it's not like you could even put them in front of the TV, could you? No TV, no television, no radio, nothing. I was, you know, the entertainment. That was all there was. What was school like? What were you taught at school or or were girls just not educated? Well, we were educated to become obedient, subservient wives. That was our education. So for example... We had a class called biology, right? Because to be accredited, you have to teach biology. But actually, we learned Hilfus Lush and Hara, which are the laws of proper speech. We had a class called chemistry. We never opened a chemistry book. We never went into the lab. We never did a single chemistry experiment. The woman who was teaching it had no degree herself, was super pregnant with baby number 11, And knew as much about chemistry as I know about nuclear physics. Nothing. Because the idea was, why do you need to educate women if their only purpose is to do what their husband says and have babies? An educated woman is a dangerous woman. She'll have ideas. She can argue. She'll ask questions. You don't want any of those things. You want her to be silent, obedient, and subservient. You don't want to educate those women. You know, there's a a line in the Gemara that says a father who teaches his daughter Talmud and Gemara is teaching her prostitution. How did you meet your husband? Well, you know, all through the Shidduch system, which is like this matchmaking system. So it's about as fun and sexy as, I don't know, Dental work, that's the only thing I can think of. So you don't date, right? Again, go back to the 1800s. There's a matchmaker and she sets you up and there's all these rules, right? Because you're not allowed to touch a man. You can't shake his hand. But forget about not being able to touch him. You're not allowed to be in the same room as him by yourself. So how do you date someone if you can't touch them and you can't be alone with them? Mm. And you can only spend three hours per date And generally in my world, I mean, I did manage to go out with three people because I kept saying, nope, nope, nope. And by the third one who became my husband, uh, my parents basically said, if he's not a serial killer, you're marrying him. Like, this is ridiculous. You've already said no to two. Like, who do you think you are? Like, this guy is it, right? And that was what happened. You know, I didn't want to marry him, but I didn't have a choice. And, And he's a lovely person. This has nothing to do with him. You know, he's actually a dear friend of mine. He's a good man, but we should never have been married. And what made the marriage so miserable is that we had very clearly delineated and defined roles. He was the master and commander. I was the silent, subservient slave. And that didn't work well for either of us because I'm not silent and I'm not good at being subservient and he's not good at being a master. So it just was a fiasco, you know? And and the other thing is that he was taught there is a a uh, saying in Kohelis in Ecclesiastes, which says, Al tarba sicha im haisha, which means don't have a lot of conversation with a woman. And the commentaries say, don't think this means a strange woman. This is referring to your wife. Because if you spend too much time with your wife, if you're too affectionate with her, it will take away from your Torah learning. You won't become a great scholar. So my husband was taught no foreplay, sex, recite psalms as you're doing it, and then move to the other bed because we sleep in separate beds, right? As about romantic 
really as dentistry, although I'm sure, mm -hmm. sorry, dentists will take offense to that. Dentistry is wonderful. I use them all the time, but it's not a very sexy thing mm -hmm. to think about. And that's really what it was like. It was a chore, like folding laundry or feeding the children. It was fold laundry, feed the children, you know, have sex. I mean, it was so unexciting and not even connected. Mm. Sex with two people who love each other brings you so much closer. This was not that. This was lay still, get the job done, move along. How did you feel on your wedding day? Were you excited? Were you nervous? I was extraordinarily petrified because as this man is walking towards me, I realized I know nothing about him. I don't know what food he likes. I don't know anything about him. I don't know if he's funny, if he's interesting. I literally, my now, and it's not marriage where you think, well, if I don't like it, I can get a divorce. That's not how it works. A woman can't get a divorce. Her husband could beat her, hang her off a, a balcony. He could torment her. He could beat the children. She can't divorce him. A man has to give a wife permission for her to leave him. And I don't know about you, but most abusers that I know are not relinquishing their, uh, the person they're abusing. And they're like, oh yes, I've spent the last 10 years smacking you around, no problem, I'm gonna give you a divorce. That just doesn't happen. So these women are really locked. So when you're marrying someone, you know that you're stuck with this man for life. Because even if you're miserable, if he doesn't wanna give you a divorce, you can't divorce him. So here comes a total stranger who's gonna be my master and commander, who I can never leave. And I don't even know him. It was a terrifying feeling. Terrifying. There's a huge amount of segregation in your former community and in most forms of Orthodox religion, really. So at your wedding itself, can you explain how the day unfolded? Yes. So the way that it works is that, again, men and women are segregated completely, right? The only time you have interaction with a man is if he's your husband, your child, or if you have a Shabbos meal, like you have one of these, you know, Friday night or Saturday, and you invite a family and they have children, then you see. The way that it works is any wedding, because you're not allowed to sing or dance in front of men. In my community, women are responsible for men's sins. It's not their fault, it's ours. Hmm. So for example, I was told you know, during Hurricane Sandy, which was this hurricane that decimated New York, that it was our fault that Hurricane Sandy came because our wigs were too long. So we weren't modest enough and therefore mm -hmm. God brought Hurricane Sandy. Well, that makes sense. So Hurricane Sandy was women's fault, of course, right? Um, so in my wedding, the part that's called the Bedeckin, that's where the women gather around the woman and then the men go and have their tish, and then the guy comes in and he uncovers my veil. And then you have the chuppah, which is where the ceremony takes place. And a man walks around a woman seven times because he is her world now for this, you know, the seven days that the world was created. Uh, and then you go to something called the yichud room where you're supposed to be alone for the first time in your life with a man, except I was a nida. I was menstruating. And if you have your period and you're menstruating, you're unclean. So I still wasn't allowed to be with my husband alone. So in my fopa, in my room where we're supposed to touch and be alone for the first time, I had my siblings there too. <laughs> so Hana and Yitzhak, my, you know, my, I was 19. So my nine-year-old sister and my eight-year-old brother were in the room with me. And we had to pretend you know, we stayed there for 30 minutes so people would think that we were alone. And then we walked out and then you get completely segregated and the husband goes to dance with the men. And then there's this huge wall in between. An actual wall. Women dance here. And that wall, it can be a wall. Sometimes oh, like it's something a called a machitza, which could be, no, no, it's generally much stronger than a sheet. So it's either wooden or it's metal or it's just a full on wall right? Because they don't want men to be able to watch women dancing. So I didn't see my husband until the wedding was over. Uh, at the very end, you sit at this table, you and your husband, you know, but 99% of the wedding, you're completely segregated. 
When did you have to start covering your hair and why? So the day that you get married, after the chuppah, after the ceremony, your hair is now your husband's. No one else is allowed to see it because hair is sensual. And I remember asking my rabbi once, but wigs are so beautiful. How can you tell the difference? And his response to me was, no one wants to bite into a fake apple. And that's, that was the example he used, that you know, if you have a bowl of crystal fruit or glass fruit, they may look very beautiful, but you don't want to bite it. And so the men in the community know that it's a wig, and therefore they're not attracted to it. That was the basic concept. And again, it comes and stems from the fact that women need to cover themselves, not just in their attire, but to hide themselves away so that men shouldn't sin. Mm -hmm. It is my responsibility to control men's thoughts and men's actions. That's the world I come from. So what's the practicality of wearing a wig all day? When can you take it off? So technically, you're only supposed to wear a wig when you're outside of the house, when there's a stranger outside of the house. There is a chumrah, which is a stringency, which says that if you want righteous children, the walls of your house should not see your nakedness. And when I got married, my husband wanted me to cover my hair 24 hours a day, even while sleeping, because he wanted righteous children. And it was on me, Mm. right? Not on him. I had to be covered head to toe. And I'm an insomniac to begin with. I have a very hard time sleeping. I'm working on it, but it's really difficult for me. And to keep something on your head so that no hair escapes while you're sleeping and moving around, you need something to attach it to your hair. So I would sleep with metal pins in my head, digging into my scalp, because that was the only way to ensure that my head covering didn't fall off. But uh, that didn't really work out very well for me. I went on a tickle strike. (laughs) And what did that involve? So, you know, you don't sleep in a wig. There's something called a tickle, which is kind of like a kerchief, but it's basically pre-made. So it's got elastic around the front and elastic in the back. So like a shower cap a little bit. That is the best. Oh my goodness. Yes, it is exactly like a shower cap. So it's a big black shower cap that has, um, you know, it's made out of material. It's very dark, so you can't see inside the hair. And I would take this and clip these metal pins in. And I couldn't sleep at all. I, I have such difficulty sleeping to have metal shards raking my skull while I'm trying to sleep. It was just, it was not feasible. So I told my husband that, and again, this is not his fault because this is what he was taught. He just wanted to have righteous children. He wasn't trying to torment me. This is That's why I always say it's not his fault. He's as much a victim as I was. Mm. But he told me, Julia, are you crazy? We need to have righteous children. All my friends' wives sleep with their hair covered. And I said, well, congratulations to all your friends' wives. I can't do it. And he said, well, too bad. You have to. And so I went on a tickle rebellion. And what that looks like was, okay, so imagine this big black sock, right? That's basically what it is. It's a big sock that you put over your head. Instead of ending at my forehead hairline covering all my hair, I pulled it over my entire face, past my chin. So basically, my husband was talking to a black sock. You couldn't see my eyes, you couldn't see my nose, you couldn't see my mouth. And I said to him, look, if you find my hair at home so objectionable, my face is objectionable too. Mm. Either I get to take off the shape tickle or I'm going to wear it like this, covering my entire face. And he laughed and he thought, okay, whatever. Let's see how long this lasts. Don't forget, I was a teenager. I was 19 years old. Mm. But I'm a very stubborn woman. And so I kept it up and his friends would come over and his wife would come out with a black sock on her head. <laughs> and so eventually he just got so embarrassed and uncomfortable and he realized I'm not giving up. He finally let me sleep without hair covering and metal pins in my head. What a victory. What a victory. (laughs) What did you know about sex before your wedding night? Well, probably more than most people because I was surreptitiously reading like English Regency romances because 
I couldn't read anything current. It was too wild, right? So I read like Barbara Cartland novels that were all like, and they went into bed and it was magic and she woke up and she was a woman. So that was my basic understanding. I wasn't sure exactly how it worked, but I knew it was supposed to be beautiful and magical and you became a woman. That was my understanding. That was it. I knew nothing else. Is that how it went for you? No, (laughs) not even close. Again, this is not my husband's Mm. fault. He was taught no foreplay, right? So if you don't have foreplay, you have no... Lubrication. Exactly. There's no lubrication. And so when he entered me, it was excruciatingly painful Mm. because it went from zero to someone inside of me. Mm. You know, we tried again and again. It didn't really work. My hymen didn't break. And by that time, the walls of my vagina were so sore Mm. from this constant abrasion without any warmth or sweetness or kindness Mm. or, you know, nothing. It was really horrible. It was a duty that we both had to do. Can you explain how the laws of female purity work with your period? Do you have two hours? (laughs) Okay, so this is very complex. So. Before you get married, since women and men are not taught, men know a little bit more because they study the Talmud and women are not allowed to. You have something called a kala teacher and a chassan teacher. A kala is a bride, a chassan is a groom. So you have a, a teacher who's supposed to teach the bride about the ways of the bed and a man who's supposed to teach the groom about the ways of the bed. What ends up happening is very different. All my teacher taught me was the laws of family purity, which is what happens once you menstruate. And it's extremely complex and very frightening because the stakes are that if you do it wrong, your child will not be able to go to heaven and will be cut off from the Jewish nation for eternity. So those are some pretty serious stakes. So you don't want to make- No pressure. No pressure. And of course, it's all in the world, Mm. shockingly enough, right? Mm. So how it works is as follows. You have to, the entire time you're bleeding, you and your husband are not allowed to touch. When you say touch, you don't just mean you're not allowed to have sex. No, when I say touch, I don't mean just not have sex. He can't touch your finger. He can't pass you the salt. He can't sit on the same couch as you. Because you're dirty. Because I'm dirty. Mm -hmm. He can't pass you your baby. If you fall on the ground and you trip, he cannot help you. He's not allowed to be in any way, shape, or form interacting with you in a physical way. Even it's literally, if I would say, if I'm holding a baby and I say, can you please pass me a bottle? He's not allowed to do that. And is that the same for everybody or just your husband? No, just my husband. No men are allowed to touch me at all together, no matter pure or any pure, right? I'm forbidden for any man to touch, not to shake my hand or give me a hug. The only man who's allowed to touch me is my husband, and he's only allowed to touch me when I'm pure. Mm-hmm. Now, once you finish menstruating, you need five clean days before you can go to the mikvah, which is this ritual bath that you take to purify yourself. Now, how do you count five clean days? This is going to get fun. You ready for this? Okay. I'm ready. So twice a day in the morning and before sunset, you have to take a white cloth, stick it up your vagina, roll it around, take it out and see if there's any color on it. Now, we as women know that we secrete a lot of very strange things from there Mm. that aren't blood. Mm. So almost without fail, invariably, every single month, you stick this cloth up your vagina, it comes out and there's this weird color. Mm. Is it red? Is it pink? Is it orange? We don't know. Unclear. Unclear, but it's not white. So if it's not white, guess what you have to do? You have to take this little baggie and this little cloth that you've just stuck in your vagina and bring it to your neighborhood rabbi. Okay. Who then gets to look at it up and down to decide, Mm -hmm. is this period blood or is this some other secretion? Julia, stop it. I I mean, you can't make this You can't make this up. It gets better. It gets better. If you're walking through the day and in the five clean days, you have to wear white underwear, right? So that colors are clear. And so in those five days, if you secrete something on your panties, you have to bring the panties to your rabbi so that he can determine whether or not you have to start the count all over again. 
Now, finally, you have your five clean days, and now you have to go to the mikvah to the ritual bath. Now, what does that entail? Mm. Well, first of all, again, and the stakes are, if you mess this up, your children are separated from the Jewish world forever, for all eternity, and it's on you. You can't have any extraneous anything on your entire body. So no nail polish, definitely no makeup, no fake lashes, but it gets much further than that. No dead skin, no cuticles. Anything that's not considered living, like let's say, for example, you have a scab, you had a mm. bruise. Scab, no good. You got to take it off. Doesn't matter if it's ready or not. If it's a scab, it's coming off because otherwise oh it's not kosher. So anything on your body that's not like literally attached to you and living, like skin, mm. eyes, nose, mouth, is no good. You clean yourself. It takes like an hour and a half. You have to scrub yourself. And my God, if I would spend so many hours making sure that not an iota of nail polish, nothing was extraneous. Then you go to the mikvah, to the ritual bath, and there's a mikvah attendant. So what you have to do is you shower and you wash yourself again, just in case in between your home and coming to the mikvah, some little particle got on your body. When you think you're ready, you press a button and this woman comes. You have to strip naked. And then she basically body searches you. She opens every cavity and you understand exactly what I'm What's she looking for? To make sure that there's no extraneous dirt. There's not a little black spot. There's not a wow. hair. Nothing. And so you have to literally stand there while this woman, you know, not just looks you up and down, but like, for example, it used to happen all the time. I have, like, I would get these cuticles by my thumb and I would cut them and she'd say, no, no, it's not cut enough. And she would just take and snip more. It was not very comfortable to put it mildly. And then when she decides you're clean enough, then she takes you to this ritual bath and you have to, again, get naked. You go inside the water, you dunk, and you have to submerge your entire body and then you come up and she says kosher if you've dumped your whole body if a hair came out of the water you have to start it all over you dunk three times she pronounces you kosher you get back into getting dressed and now you are required that night to have sex with your husband so much fun yeah that would really put you in the mood I think oh yes that definitely puts you in the mood I mean by the time you're done with all this. You feel, I mean, I used to come, I hated the mikvah night. I hated it. I hated all of it. And knowing that I have to have sex and sex is about as, you know, just as exciting as laundry. It was just such a horrible mm. feeling. You know, I used to kind of like make the clean days last as long as I could so that, oh, I don't think this is good. And oh, I yeah. forgot that so that I wouldn't have to go to the mikvah. And that's only half the story because what happened next is that Julia left. But how did she leave? Because she didn't know what the world outside her community even looked like, let alone how to do basic things like open a bank account or drive or catch a cab or use the internet. How on earth did she manage to get out and build a whole new life? If you're a Mamma Mia subscriber, you can hear part two of my conversation with Julia right now. So what finally propelled me out the door was my daughter came home crying because she had been accused of cheating. And she was made taunted because they called her a lesbian. And I, I just, it hit me then that if I don't leave, she'll be 42 years old and wanting to commit suicide just like me. We discuss not just how she got out logistically and physically got away from her community and what it meant for her family and, you know, her children, but also how she deprogrammed herself and all the beliefs that she had grown up with and she'd lived with and she'd practised. How did she undo all of that? I was literally having sex with a Cirque du Soleil acrobat with my wig on my head, totally naked, too afraid to take off my wig. And all the firsts she had. First time she watched Sex in the City. First time she brought a vibrator. First time she had sex with a man that hadn't been chosen for her. So many firsts. You can hear about all of these firsts and the other part of Julia's story by following the links in the show notes. And you can find her book Brazen in any good bookstore. No Filter is produced by Gia Moylan and the executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman. 
Thanks for listening.